as a physician scientist, I believe that the, the clinical data structures that we use to take care of patients are fundamental barriers to discovery. I'm going to explain why I feel this way, um, how these problems are being circumvented, and, and what I think that that means. Uh, the first barrier is a philosophical one. You know, in, in our current paradigm, we consider research and patient care to be two completely separate use cases. And what that means is we develop clinical data structures that don't facilitate research, which is a problem. Because in a precision medicine paradigm, research and clinical care have to converge. It's only when you are actively studying everyone you're taking care of that you can understand why they're different, why that matters, and how you need to adjust standard care to incorporate those differences. Now, in medicine, that's compounded by other problems. Uh, our, our data landscape is notoriously fragmented. Uh, about 80% of the data we generate in the process of patient care is what's known as unstructured. It's things like the notes we write to each other, uh, medical images, waveforms captured from patient monitors, and all of those data types are resistant to traditional databasing technologies and analysis. But we compound that problem further by things like sloppy data collection practices that, that create poor quality data sets. And that's before you start to look at the regulatory problems, accessing data, or the policy problems, like a lack of a consistent definition of what's known as social license, which are the conditions under which data collected for a primary purpose, in this case, patient care, can be used for a secondary purpose, in this case, research. And the consequence of this is that the data we use in clinical research incompletely represents patients. Uh, we're like the blind men interacting with the elephant here. We get a cut of data that allows us to perfectly describe a tail or a tusk or a trunk at the expense of a holistic understanding of who that patient is in data. And this doesn't just hinder discovery, it creates a very competitive culture in research. Yeah. Researchers that have access to high quality data sets treat it more like personal property than a platform that can facilitate discovery. And this contributes to a crisis of reproducibility and it's hard for me as a scientist to overstate how important a problem this is. Now, reproducibility is the ability to reproduce an experiment done by another scientist. And it's the means by which scientists communicate pragmatic knowledge to one another but by being able to reproduce an experiment and get the same results, you actually know that what has been discovered is some fundamental truth. 70% of researchers have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's uh, research, which is a stunning statistic. Even before you know that more than half try and fail to reproduce their own experiments. And, and what this means pragmatically is that what we offer our patients as scientists in medicine right now is a scenario where we may be offer, able to offer them yesterday's science tomorrow. We ask you to participate in research. We say we might discover something that can be applied at some point in the future to a patient like you or a patient with your characteristics. Now, what this means for the pace of, of discovery and innovation in medicine is that when you compare it to sort of the status quo, we only ever make intermittent and incremental progress towards our goals of creating a much more performant healthcare system that provides much more high value care consistently. That's uh, something that has a greater impact on patients' lives. And if you look at the x-axis here, it's time. And, and you know, I'd ask you how much time you would guess passes on average between something being discovered that is of uncontroversial benefit to patients and it being experienced by patients at the point of care as the standard of care. Now, the answer is 17 years, 17 years. My area of clinical research is clinical applied machine learning. And, and we often joke in my group that we have uh, big data, but also very big problems because all of these problems I was just describing are magnified at scale. And this is a very data hungry technique. This is something that's endlessly frustrating to me as a scientist, but it's much sadder to me as a clinician. I, I'm a pediatric critical care doctor and none of the problems we choose to take on in, in my research are abstract. They have names, faces, they have families, and they have futures that I think that we can secure with a bigger and braver science. My patients don't have 17 years to wait for the science to catch up with them. But fortunately, there is a solution, and, and that solution is open science. Now, open science has many definitions, but it essentially refers to a movement to make uh, not just scientific results, uh, but through dissemination, but also methods. So things like software and hardware available to all uh, levels of society, both amateur and professional. And, and there are many components 
to open science as a concept. The ones that are most relevant for those of us that work in data science are open data sets, open access software and hardware, open research infrastructures, and open access publication. And this can seem like something really revelatory or new, but it actually isn't. You know, the, the, the purpose of the academic paper that we're all familiar with was to disseminate research findings. That's why journals came into being. But right from the beginning, there was a tension between treating scientific discovery as a public good and treating it as something that could be commodified. And that, that tension has yet to be resolved. You know, the, the, the highest impact journals are still the journals that are most expensive to publish in and typically most expensive to access, which means that the highest quality scientific insight is typically the least accessible. The opportunity that those of us that work in, in applied machine learning have is that healthcare data is increasingly digital and it's getting much, much cheaper to store. We also know now that we can systematically de-identify patient data in ways that protects their healthcare information without degrading the quality of those data sets for analysis. And that facilitates programs like the NIH's All of Us program that invites people to participate in research by committing their data longitudinally uh, in states of both illness and health. And these resulting data sets are huge. ImageNet is an example of a data set that's powered a lot of computer vision applications. It's millions and millions of images that are available free to researchers for non-commercial purposes. One that's been very important in our growth, in my group, is the Medical Information Mart for Intensive Care or MIMIC database, which is an open access database that contains the data of 40,000 critically ill patients. That's notes, x-rays, waveforms. And when you make the data available, people use it. This is a snapshot of one month of utilization of the MIMIC database I was just describing. So 12,500 users, 10,500 of which are new uh, in that month. And uh, you can see that, that users are drawn from every inhabited continent. These data sets are hosted on platforms like PhysioNet that don't just offer you the data, but also offer you soft software that helps you exploit the data, provides tutorials on how to orient yourself to not just the data set, but the tools, and then organizes challenges. And this creates the intellectual equivalent of a, the water cooler effect. You, you gather people around the resource. And what do people do when you do this? Well, they curate the data. So this is an altruistic activity of the research community to try to improve the quality of the data set, not just for an individual's research, but for posterity. And it's estimated that for the MIMIC database, there's been an excess of 10,000 hours of community curation of that data set. Uh, they can be organized into datathons, which focus on solving specific problems, or hackathons, which focus on creating new tools that help exploit data. And anyone that's ever participated in this form of research knows that it's actually very hard to going back to doing research any other way. And that's because this is typically multi-generational, multidisciplinary research in teams. Uh, and when these teams get together, they, they challenge each other, they compete with each other, they learn from each other, but most importantly, they teach us. And that's how my group got hooked on open science and these approaches. We participated in the PhysioNet Challenge in 2017, where the challenge was to try to improve an industry algorithm that detected a heart rhythm anomaly, atrial fibrillation from single lead EKGs. And this inspired us not just to make our own databasing technology for waveform data open access, but also the data set that we'd collected over a period of about 10 years using this technology. And it's an idea that scales massively. You know, the Radiological Society of North America hosts an annual datathon where they aggregate teams around a specific challenge. And in 2019, that was diagnosing um, uh, intracranial hemorrhage or bleeds within uh, the brain on CT scans. There were 25,000 annotated images provided as a training data set. 1,345 teams from around the world participated and 10 winners were selected. And this is sort of what these leaderboards look like. You don't just have the bragging rights of being on the leaderboard, but you also commit a video which explains how you got to your solution, which is an interactive and novel way of communicating research findings and your code. And so this is a code uh, base showing not just how the solution was arrived at, but the actual code itself, the hardware, the software that was used, how the data was staged, how the model was trained, and how the model was retrained. And what this does to the pace of discovery and innovation in medicine is we go from this sort of intermittent and incremental discovery that I was describing to serial solutions. 
much, much more rapid cycles of innovation where you very, very rapidly learn from another group of scientists and ideally improve their solution. And more importantly, what that does on the x-axis to that time scale is it compresses it and it moves us closer to a paradigm in which what we can offer patients is tomorrow's medicine today. I think one of the most extraordinary things about this is somewhat paradoxical, and it's that with the goal of creating data structures that facilitate artificial intelligence, I think we're finally beginning in medicine to have the kinds of structures that facilitate fully leveraging human intelligence. And I think that that's what we should have been doing all along. Thank you.